So as we come to our time for our second scripture this morning, just a reminder that in the season of Lent, we are exploring how each of these scriptures is a conversation. And so we're reading the scripture just a little bit differently rather than just one voice uh, reading the whole thing. Uh, we are going to invite participants to come up and to be uh, playing the roles of the different characters so that we can really get a sense of the scripture, uh, not just flat as one reading, but as a conversation, the way that it was intended to be. And so I today, I need three people. I need a um, narrator, a Samaritan woman, and a Jesus. I will stand here all morning. <laughs> all right, my friends. Ooh. This is my copy. This is your copy. Okay, who do we got here? Um, you guys get to fight out who gets to be who. I want the one with easy words. They're all easy words, I promise. Oh. All right. I'll be Jesus. Adam will be Jesus. You want to be the Samaritan woman? Sure, I'll be a lady. You want to be the narrator? Okay, yes. y'all need to use the microphone so everyone okay. can hear you. John, Jesus realized that the Pharisees were keeping count of the baptisms that he and John performed, although his disciples, not Jesus, did the actual baptizing. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came into Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, Would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, How come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it, and he and his sons and livestock and passed it down to us? Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I, will give, I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artisan spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty, won't ever have to come back to this well again. He said, Go call your husband and then come back. I have no husband, she said. <laughs> You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't even your husband. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. <laughs> oh, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this. Our ancestors worshipped God at this mountain, but you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. But the time is coming, it has, in fact, come. When what you're called will not matter, and where you go to worship will not matter. God is sheer, being itself spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their own very being, their spirits, their true selves, in adoration. 
Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking with that kind of a woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, Come see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. A lot more people entrusted their lives to him. When they heard what he had to say, they said to the woman, we're no longer taking this on your say-so. We've heard it for ourselves and know it for sure. He's the savior of the world. <laughs> oh, they deserve a round of applause. Oh my gosh. I love it. Awesome. Thank you all so much. This woman at the well. This morning, our work of art is an Orthodox Greek icon. And so I want to invite you to just take a look at it and uh, let's talk about what you see. A lot of blue. A lot of blue. Blue is sky, blue is royal, blue is an expensive color. You do. What is that, y'all? The well, right? So the, the designer of this particular icon kind of on the nose about the well, that it's a cross, yeah. What's up? They have no shoes. A lot, of, a lot of people. Tell me at that story that we just read, when Jesus meets the woman at the well, were there any people there? There were not. There were not. So there's multiple things that the person that uh, created this icon is trying to do at once. Um, tell you the story uh, in one image all at, at the same time. And so um, you have the encounter of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. On the left, you have, who do you think, can you kind of see their faces well enough? Who do you think those people are? Those are the disciples, right? Who are kind of looking like, what is happening here? Right? They were shocked. What does it say in the scripture? They were shocked at what was going on, right? So they're expressing their dismay. And then on the right side of the panel, what has happened? So that's, she does appear twice, right? So again, this is sort of one image trying to tell the entire story. So she's sitting there with Jesus at the well, but then on the right-hand side, she's doing what? She went to go back, she went back into the community to share what had happened to her, to give uh, what we would call today her testimony, right? To say, this is what happened, um, and then the people uh, shared and believed, and um, again, at the end, I love how it says, well, we're, not, we're no longer to take this on her say-so. We've experienced it for ourselves, which is kind of how, how it goes, right? We have to own our faith for ourselves. He is. So what does that tell you about Jesus? Have you ever had an encounter with someone who clearly does not have time for you? How does that feel? Mm. It does. You know, you just feel unsettled in that. But when somebody sits down and looks you in the eye and ha takes the time to have that conversation and to listen to you and to share, it means the world, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> icons are fun. Uh, icons are fun. They're, like, they're, um, there's something unique about icons. Their perspective is always a little wonky. Um, it's a little off often, um, you know. Um, and so, yeah, certainly he'd be like, <laughs> he'd be like 10 feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's like um, this, this sort of um, design into the hill, but it is remindful of some kind of um, roof almost, but no, on the, I mean, it's similar on the left, but there's plants growing out of it. So, um, you know, icons again, they're just, they're really interesting how they uh, portray images. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thanks, Justin, you can move that on. So as we're thinking about this story of um, this woman who went to the well, I want to invite you to a meeting. How's that sound? Does it? I don't know what kind of meetings you've been to. <laughs> my, my mother tells my kids that I have more meetings than the president. But that's not the kind of meeting, obviously, that I'm talking about. There won't be any minutes taken at this meeting. No Robert's rules to follow to keep everything orderly and organized. It's going to be nothing like the meeting we're going to have in just a few minutes after worship, in other words. But maybe it will be. I'm inspired by Elaine, our moderator, that maybe she will turn our meeting into the kind of meeting I'm talking about on her night of no sleep that I heard. So I'm going to invite you to this meeting, but I can't tell you what's on the agenda. I can't even tell you who's invited. I can tell you that it will change your life. And are you interested in that kind of meeting? The kind of meeting I have in mind isn't planned or programmed. So good are we at that kind of meeting in the church. No, this meeting happens when you least expect it, which is the kind of meeting we in the church need to get better at. Like this woman we read about this morning, out just doing her daily chore. That's all she was doing, right? She wasn't planning on going to a meeting. She didn't organize her notes, comb her hair, prepare her thoughts and ideas. Quite the opposite. In this story, she was banking on not meeting anyone that day. The Samaritan woman chose to go to the well says in the scripture specifically at noon. And if you think about it, noon in a desert climate is the hottest time of the day. That is not when the women would go to the well to collect their water. So if you think about it, what was she trying to do? She was trying to avoid everybody, right? So she was hoping that no one else would be there. Carrying her bucket, she goes to the well at the end, to the edge of town during the hottest part of the day. She's hopeless, she's tired, and she makes her way to the well hoping to be alone, to get away, to cry where no one would see or hear her. This woman we know lives sort of on the fringes of her community. And I can only imagine what it felt like when she realized she was not alone at the well that day. With Jesus there, she had no chance to stay hidden. So the Jesus we encounter in the Bible is one who shows up at these peculiar meetings and sees invisible people. The Jesus waits on the well so he can have a meeting. I wonder what Jesus was thinking as he watched her approach the well. She must have been wearing her life on her sleeve, an open book to be read that told a story of sorrow and shame, of fear and brokenness. She surely must have looked in the deepest sense about to die from thirst while fetching her buckets of water. And so Jesus breaks the ice. And in that simple request, that simple question, he breaks the barrier between them every imaginable bar a barrier you can think of, race, religion, gender, status. And he asks her simply, can you give me a drink? He uses a simple need to invite her to open up and to take that chance of an encounter that will turn in turn expose and fill every need she ever had. Underneath their conversation, if you look closely, 
You can hear Jesus inviting her to something more. As if with every comment, she's asking the woman, are you willing? Are you enough of a risk taker to meet me here? And out of this meeting, are you willing to be more than you are now? She tried at least once to deflect the conversation to social proprieties and the differences between Samaritans and Jews, but Jesus will have none of it. There is no influence that will deter the task of a God-given identity, which is what he's holding out to her. In this meeting at the well, Jesus offers her more than she could ever expect or hope for. He grants her loving attention. He treats her with dignity despite what people say. He acknowledges her worth and grants her a purpose for living. He gives her meaning and an assignment for her life. In other words, he sees her. And that changes everything. Have you ever truly been seen? In that sense, someone who sat down with you and just you felt understood and heard and known and seen. It's rare. If you have, give thanks. It's rare. Being seen as one of humanity's deepest longings. Truly seen, which is to say understood, accepted, valued, respected, and known. The infant wants to be seen when they start wailing from their playpen. It's the kid who wants to be seen when he gets caught sneaking alcohol from his parents' liquor cabinet. It's the elderly patient who keeps pressing the button for the nurse to come in just so that she won't feel lonely. Just to be seen. So when the Samaritan woman finds herself in this particular meeting and being seen, really being seen by this man who got it, who saw every line of pain written in her face and every weighty, immense, invisible burden she carried in her empty water jug, it must have felt like heaven. So imagine being out on an errand on some ordinary day and running headlong into heaven. It can happen anywhere when we least expect it, at the town well or the town dump, at the coffee shop or the school cafeteria. This morning, I want to invite you to a meeting. And this meeting starts with a question, something to ask yourself every morning when you wake up or sip your coffee and check your eye calendar for the day. Where will I meet Jesus today? What would it be like to set out on your daily routine expecting, expecting to see Jesus somewhere in it? Ah, that'd be so cool. But you know what? I got to tell you, it's probably not going to happen like a flash of dazzling light like the transfiguration story we read a couple weeks ago or accompanied by thunder and lightning, is it? No, chances are he'll show up in someone quite ordinary and someone you usually don't see Maybe even someone you don't know very well. Because the truth of it is, we don't see each other very well. We don't stop and take the time to listen and connect, except in passing shots in a text or touching base. But what would it be like to go out and find yourself being seen, known, meeting someone for real? They might just offer you a bit of heaven, and the grace is worth it to get to that meeting, isn't it? The main lesson of the text is this. Get to the well. Just go. Open yourself up just enough. The miracle is, is that Jesus will meet you there. It sounds a lot easier than it is, because we get pretty comfortable being thirsty being invisible. 
We would rather walk over desolate terrain in the hot sun, allowing our problems to push us further and further from community and deeper into our own pain, shame, or grief, than to risk being vulnerable and needing to be seen. In this story, John lets us know how strong a hold her past had on her, how much she had to overcome in order to consider what God was asking her to become. She had to overcome every message the world sent her that she was unworthy, unlovable, unacceptable. And thoughts are very powerful. What we think informs how we behave. Thoughts can drag us down or inspire us, and she was full of the kind that loads you down. But she risks everything to meet with Jesus and to let him in, and Jesus offers her a new way of thinking, a new perspective, and she answers him, oh, man, give me this water, give me this way of life where I can see myself not through the eyes of the world, but through God's eyes. I am beloved. Imagine how the world would be different if we did that. My friends, for me, this story, it all comes down to this. It doesn't matter who you are. What matters is who you're willing to become. A meeting. This Lent, I invite you to awaken to the image of standing before you with a cup full of water for a thirsting soul, but first he wonders, are you ready for a meeting? I can't tell you what's on the agenda. I can't even tell you when or where this meeting will take place or who else is invited. It's interesting in the gospel, John doesn't tell us her name. He probably didn't have to. Everyone knew her by her reputation. But he left her anonymous to challenge us about the way that we name and label people without seeing them, without knowing who they really are. And leaving her nameless, he invites every woman and every man to come to the well, to come and to show up for a meeting. Just you and me, Jesus whispers, out doing errands. Amen.